My guest today on Getting the Yes And is Brian Bannon. Brian is commissioner of the Chicago Public Library. He is responsible for the 80 libraries that serve Chicago's 2.6 million residents. Chicago's library is the largest and most visited civic institution in the city and one of the largest in the United States. Prior to coming to Chicago, Brian held a variety of leadership positions at the San Francisco Public Library, the Seattle Public Library, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Brian is active in work related to information access, public technology, and the digital divide and was named as one of the most creative people of 2016 by Fast Company. Brian, welcome to Getting to Yes And. Thanks for having me. So, the writer Neil Gaiman once said, do you know the quote? No, but, well, I don't know what quote you're going to give. He said, rule number one, don't fuck with librarians. <laughs> That's a good rule. Is it, is it correct? It's a really good rule, yeah. yeah. I learned that early in my career and in the field. <laughs> and absolutely true. I loved it. I, it came right up. And I found another great quote uh, from Second City alum Amy Poehler, which was delivered as her character Leslie Nope in Parks and Rec. And the quote is, the library is the worst group of people ever assembled in history. They're mean, <laughs> conniving, rude, and extremely well-read, which makes them dangerous. Also true. Well, not not completely true, but yeah, definitely well read. I, I loved it. I, there immediately is like the attack on librarians and the city. Yeah, it, it was great. So I started doing research for our conversation, and I realized that I have a completely outmoded idea of how libraries operate today, um, which is sad because I'm a big reader and I actually go to our, our local library here in Chicago. Uh, and one of the things that intrigued me w most was how active libraries have become. Uh, in American Libraries Magazine, an article said that libraries must be nimble, creative, and customer-focused, and above all, must embrace learning, which sounds like a tech startup. Very much, yeah. Yeah, tell us about that. What, what yeah, is it? You know, what's interesting about libraries is that um, definitely public libraries are going through a renaissance, not just within the United States, but really around the world. Um, libraries are popping up um, more and more in the developing world um, as incubators for um, economic development. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly, we're seeing in urban centers a, a revitalization and interest in them. One of the things I think is actually really cool about public libraries is that um, it's sort of what is old is new again, is that the mm -hmm. idea of a public library is a physical public space where people uh, uh, shared interests in, in an idea or a question would come together um, and serendipity um, of those uh, people colliding actually comes um, out of uh, Benjamin Franklin's first sort of idea of what a public library ought to do, be, that we needed public spaces um, uh, for people to um, connect um, uh, sort of randomly around their interests. And so uh, if you looked at Franklin's first uh, library that still is actually a museum today, it was a, ha it was a, it was a warehouse of books, like we think about sort of public libraries. But right at the center was where he did experiments with technology, um, experiments with um, electricity. And so it was a, it was a vibrant um, uh, town square of thinking and knowledge and ideas. Um, and that really is what the, um, the, the genesis and the history of what a public library is about. They're intended to be um, creative, um, vibrant, um, uh, centers for creati creativity and learning, and it's very specifically though libraries different than, than than other institutions. It's it's intended to do that for very specific reasons in our society. One is to have a, uh, help support a stronger, more informed democracy, and the other is really to um, to shape um, uh, our future uh, economy. And it, when even when Franklin was talking about the need for public libraries or the idea of public libraries, um, you know, 250 years ago, it was about creating um, a, a knowledge based economy. It was about creating a, a global globally competitive economy by creating informed citizens, and part of it was creating informal spaces for learning. So it's, it really is, yes, we're going through a renaissance, but it's actually, we're sort of bringing back Franklin's idea of what public innovation, public spaces are really about. Right. I mean, s somewhere along the way, the storytelling changed, right? Mm -hmm. And so we got this idea of librarians as uh, taskmasters and li libraries as places where uh, you need to be silent. And, and when you when you just even go to the website for the Chicago Public Library, it, it is like, there's so much stuff right. going on. And I remember I was working on my thesis um, on the Beat Generation, and I had to go to the new Newberry Library, and that's right across from the old Bughouse Square. Uh, yeah, with the where you know dissent would happen, and it was mm -hmm. like dissent in proximity to the library, uh, which is not something I think that was in anyone's consciousness, but absolutely is is you know in the history and and something apparently you're bringing back now. Yeah, you know, and I think that's what's interesting too about this this idea of quiet. Um, there's actually a, a, a great book called um, Quiet, um, something about the, a world of basically extroverts uh, that mm -hmm. can't shut up. Yeah. Um, but this idea of being quiet is certainly something that that um, is part of what libraries are, but there's um, librarians in general are often quite radicals. I mean, as, as institutions, we're actually quite radical in the sense that um, what public librarians particularly have been on the forefront for, you know, 
for many many years um, is 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 uh, uh, the idea of, of information access, intellectual freedom, the right to privacy, the freedom to read, to learn. Um, uh, these ideas, you know, we, we see them transpire in, in many different spaces related to um, uh, the filtering of um, information, um, uh, censorship of materials, mm -hmm. and so so while librarians necess don't necessarily have this sort of persona of being really radical figures, they have actually not just as individuals but as a field, we have been on the forefront of just about every social justice movement um, around for, for many, many years. So it's a, it is a, um, we're in this moment where I think we're, we're, we're grabbing the voice of libraries and the, the radical mission of libraries and then mirroring that too with what we're trying to do in our communities to be stronger, more democratic, better connected, um, and especially in a world that seems to be more fragmented and less connected, even though we have access to more information than any other point in history. Yeah, right. Um, you know, part of the formula for success that I've seen at Second City, where I work over the last three decades, was twofold. Uh, one, you have practices and behaviors that promote collaboration, empathy, and engagement. And two, you have a creative space, uh, which is a place where you can feel safe to act, and that can mean anything. That's exploring, failing, learning, and I think good libraries are that, right? Yeah, I would say for sure. Uh, not just for the people who come and use them, for the, but the, for uh, the people who actually work there every right. day. So it's both those things. Yeah, yeah I think it needs to be. Um, I want you to talk about the Maker Lab. I, I, I was fascinated by uh, uh, this this invention that happened. Right. Yeah. So you know what's great about the Maker Lab is it's a physical space. Um, uh, Harold Washington Library, but we also have pop-ups around the city where there's manufacturing equipment. There's 3D printers, um, uh, 3D scanners, uh, vinyl cutters, uh, CNC milling machines. We teach uh, coding, creative creative design, you know, manufacturing. Uh, but the genesis of that idea actually came out of the city's plan for economic growth and jobs. We had a, um, a group of folks who were looking at sort of what we're trying to achieve as a city. And um, this plan really looks at being uh, Chicago's desire to be a global leader in advanced manufacturing. Um, and uh, there's a a whole series of strategies the city's laid out to do that. But one of the fundamental questions that the team asked was, like, do people even know what that is? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you look at the world of advanced manufacturing, um, that is actually one of the big questions, is that if you think about kids who are looking at future careers, the best way to engage kids in, uh, in what a career might be is to is to show them what that could look like. And many people don't didn't know what that was. So we decided to do a pop-up um, uh, at the Harold Washington Library and, and introduce sort of those ideas in a much more sort of experiential way. It was intended just to be a, a six-month like let's see what this you know throw this on the wall see you know see if this works but what was really extraordinary about it is we had 30,000 people visit this small little makerspace in a six month period we had 4,000 people complete a class in some aspect of manufacturing but what, what was most interesting to us is that um, it's become this sort of uh, and it, in a short period became this sort of creative center that brought together you know uh, research scientists that were trying to figure out you know from Loyola University trying to figure out how to integrate 3D printing into the operating room uh, working directly next to to um, a group of you know kids who are trying to design um, uh, parts for a bicycle, next to an entrepreneur who was trying to prototype, next to uh, you know a, a, an artist who was trying to make jewelry, and so what what it did, sort of by accident, is mm -hmm. created um, and actually provided a space for a community of people um, that were looking for such a space. And what was even more interesting and exciting about it for us is that when you look at other maker spaces around Chicago, or really if you look at them nationally, they look a very specific way. They you know the um, uh, the age of the folks is is pretty homogeneous, the, the race, the um, uh, as well as the gender. And so what was mm -hmm. really interesting about the space as well is not only did we get this sort of cross-section of people with very different sets of interests, but where the, that interest coalesced around needing this manufacturing equipment and knowing is that it, they also... Um, uh, much more represented what our actually our city looks like. And so when we saw that, we knew we had something special. And it, it also reminded us that that's one of the things that's so great about public libraries is that we really do touch every part of our community, um, the richest, the poorest, um, mm -hmm. the educated formally, the, you know, the, the self-educated. And it's a space that everyone trusts. It's a, a space that people come to naturally. And it's a space um, that really lends itself to be a platform for this kind of creative endeavor. So that's why we you know, continue to keep it. In fact, when we looked at um, closing it down, because we just had six months of funding, um, uh, Motorola approached us and said, hey, look, we think this is such important work for our city. Um, we'd like to continue to support it. So they did. So it's a, you uh -huh. know, sometimes when something works, um, 
people will literally come knocking at your door saying, how can we help? And that was the case for the, uh, the Maker Lab. That's great. Yeah, I mean, in our pedagogy, improvisational pedagogy, um, you know, there's a transfer of knowledge. Uh, there, there, there's talk, uh, but it's in the doing that mm-hmm. that is that makes a complete difference. Um, and I love the fact that you know, smack dab inside a place where where the, all those books are are places where uh, kids and adults side by side are doing and creating together because that in of itself creates a whole other kind of dynamic. It sure does. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, U Media is another initiative that. Can Combine learning with mm-hmm. action, um, uh, and Chance the Rapper came out of that program, right? Yeah, right. So um, back in 2009, I, you know, again, M- the MacArthur Foundation approached the Chicago Book Library and said, "Hey, we have this research on how teens learn." Um, you know, looking back, it's pretty obvious, but basically, they first want to be comfortable in their social environment before they can be ready to learn. And then it's um, the idea is that teens want the opportunity to tinker and to play, yeah. um, and play is such a critical part of learning, but so the opportunity just to experiment, to play. And then when they land on something that really piques their interest, the ability to go deep. Mm-hmm. And so their vision and their idea with this, was to take this research and turn it into reality, into a public space that was designed for that. So they didn't go to a formal school for that, because mm-hmm. schools aren't really designed. They went to the library and said, hey, look, would you guys be interested? And and we were, and we did. And so today, um, that is now in Manifest. We have 12 Umedia sites around the city, and we do you know Umedia programming many more libraries. But what we found is that this space that has you know has recording a recording studio has 3D printers it has um, graphic arts graphic designs the uh, the space itself has become this incredible incubator of connecting kids to all kinds of things that they, they maybe wouldn't have you know known about otherwise Chance is a great success story and you know it's actually very obviously well known mm-hmm. um, uh, today uh, but he made his first mixtape um, at the Harold Washington Library in our recording studio Wow um, and he actually has a song about the the media space and he's helped us open media spaces around um, the city. We've also had lesser known, lesser famous uh, folks who've learned um, product, how to do product design. And we have a mm-hmm. whole line on fashion. Where we have a group of kids who um, uh, start at the beginning and go through a series of workshops where they um, uh, they refine their brand. They actually um, learn how to sew. We have sewing machines in the space. Mm-hmm. They, actually cre- you know, they actually create the actual product. And then we actually have a fashion show at the end of the year. And so there's a variety of different streams. And again, the idea is through an informal creative space, connect kids to each other um, around their shared interests, provide lots of different opportunities to explore and to play. And then when kids want to go deeper, Deeper, they have the ability, the mentorship, um, and the tools to do that. And uh, again, what we found is it's been a, it's a highly successful program, um, connects kids in, in all kinds of really ways that are productive in terms of their careers, but also productive in terms of their creative process. And um, you know, we, we, we've been looking more deeply at the kids that we're reaching. And again, it's, it's not the kids that you would expect mm-hmm. uh, would be ending up in, you know, in, a, in a library. Um, more than 50% of the, uh, of the teens who use the space are boys, um, mm-hmm. and, um, and predominantly African-American boys. Um, and, and the kids, on average, are coming five miles um, around the city uh, to get to the space. And so we that's think a, there's something pretty away, yeah. extraordinary yeah. about it. So again, you know, I think it gets, all gets back to sort of the flavor of what a library does. It brings people together from a broad base of backgrounds, a broad base of interests, and if we can if we can create and perform that mission in a way, not just through books, but through a variety of different avenues to to awaken their curiosity, to um, support um, uh, learning in a more playful and engaging way, that it's we think it's connected to what the future of our city ought to be. Totally, I, and I think the tactile part of the learning process is something that I don't think I had much of, and 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 that wasn't good. My kids are both um, products of Chicago Waldorf, so they sew. Oh, this is very Waldorf. They, yeah. yeah, totally <laughs> yeah. right. I mean, they they are knitting and they're sewing and they're and they're, then they're like you know cutting rock, and I mean it's yep. it's great. And and they and they go outside a lot too. Yep. Um, and and I think that's an important balance in terms of education because it's it's it it becomes very rote uh, mm-hmm. uh, at its worst. I think. Yep. Um, I think there's some kind of elegant fate um, that you suffered from dyslexia as a child. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I suffered from dyslexia as a child, but also um, you did do your research. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, I also come from a family of artists. So my mother's uh-huh. a, a painter and also a floral designer. My grandfather uh, was a painter. And so, um, you know, I grew up in a small farming community. I think my, my closest neighbors were a mile down the street. Um, and when my mother discovered that I ha- was having trouble reading and learning to read, I have an older sister who was really quick with the reading, um, she knew something was up. She mm-hmm. got me tested. And, and, and although there wasn't a lot known about dyslexia, what right. she, she knew enough that she needed to help me. And so she just followed her own intuition, which is um, she got me much more engaged in the arts. She got me involved in theater. And uh, the first um, uh, stuff that she had me do is she would record all of my lines on a tape recorder. And that's how I would learn them, because I was having trouble learning to read. Mm-hmm. Um, she had me engage 
in much more sort of physical activities, um, sports, but also arts activities, painting, et cetera. And, um, you know, and so some way it, it, in some ways it sort of helped me um, get through those that hump of learning and learning how to learn. What's so interesting about what my mother did, um, there's actually programs now, there's a program in Chicago um, that's actually designed around this, this premise of, of how you engage kids in the arts as a mechanism to um, stimulate their learning. It isn't designed specifically for kids who are dyslexic. It's actually really it's great for all kids. But what she intuitively knew is that um, you know learning comes in all forms, that we right. all learn in different ways. And if one mode of learning um, uh, was a challenge, um, the, the, the hump that I really had to get over and that she helped me get over was uh, to get excited about learning. Right. And often kids who are dyslexic, uh, because they don't learn in a traditional way or the, the, you know, the one conventional way, they get turned off to learning altogether. And so for me, as, that, as that's translated into the work in libraries, is that you know while I wasn't a kid who you know sat buried in a book uh, in my childhood, I am a big reader today. Um, I, I had a different sort of view on on what it meant to support learning. And so as as I've you know found my way into libraries and found my way into you know in Chicago Public Library, that sort of that, that perspective has been really strong. And uh, one sort of very you know practical example, it's actually been the redesign of our Summer Learning Challenge. Um, a number of years ago, our, our children's librarians came uh, to us and said, hey, look, you know, there's a lot of kids who love reading during the summer months, uh, but there's some kids who don't love reading during the summer months. And really, the goal is to keep kids learning throughout the summer mm -hmm. if we really want to reduce what's called the summer slide. So why don't we sort of re refine this program and make it reading as important as other learning activities. And so for me, that immediately resonated. And um, and for the team, it really resonated. And what's been really exciting about how they've redesigned our summer reading program to a summer learning program is that, you know, one kid could be sitting right next to, a, you know, another who, who loves to read and spend their summer reading 20 minutes a day or whatever it is, right next to a kid where we're giving equal credit for doing science experiments, for doing discovery activities in museums. Right. They can win the same prizes. They can, and and they, 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 we could credential the, the learning in the same way. So to me, it's really... Being dyslexic uh, teaches you um, how to learn uh, in a different way and then probably puts a stronger value between the multitudes of ways in which people do learn. Yeah, I I had this vivid, when I when I read that about you, it took me back, I was in the car on the way home from Second City late night um, and there was a radio interview and it was with a, um, a, a PhD um, who had severe dyslexia. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about the immense bias uh, that he experienced uh, because he uh, heard his books as opposed to used his eyes for his book. And there was this moment that I had where I'm like, that's completely true. There is this value that we attach because our eyes saw something that it's of less value because you heard something. Yeah. So I, I actually just took it. You, you, you're, yep. audio, they can't hear it, but I actually travel with headphones everywhere I go. Yeah. Um, because I actually do, I, I'm also severely dyslexic. Yeah. So um, I listen to everything. Um, so, so you listen to everything. I, so yeah. I do read. That's, um, I, mean, that's I, I, I can read with my eyes, Yes. Um, but I process information much better better through auditory. That's, so what's so great too about uh, the advancements in technology is there's, a, there's there, you know, assistive technology has come a long way. So mm -hmm. all of my email, I process uh, um, listening. Um, uh, just about every book um, I process uh, listening or I, I, I read by, by listening. Sometimes I'll actually listen and uh, flip the pages at the same time. Um, there's just a, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, all of my magazines are online and so I also do those in an auditory way. And that's just the, the uh, my preferred uh, method yeah. of learning. But you're right, there is a big stigma there. And actually I just had coffee with um, a colleague the other day who um, has she has a uh, she's a she's a longtime reader um, and she had something go wrong with her eyes and she's mm -hmm. not gonna she's like a imbalance of some kind um, and she won't be able to read in a conventional way and she was articulating the same sort yeah. of guilt that yeah. you know feeling like that she wasn't really reading by listening and I just you know that that sort of premise to me. You know, reading is a really important skill for us to learn for a variety of different reasons, important for brain development, et cetera. But the process of learning should be aligned with the way in which we learn the best. And yeah. if you learn better through learning, uh, through listening, great. Through seeing, that's great. And there's a lot of other ways in which we learn. And I think the idea is to find the, one, the ways, um, the, the way or ways that work best for us and to really cultivate those, whether it's ourselves, our kids, and our families. Yeah. Our, our son had some level of uh, uh, learning disability and he used to like to fall asleep listening to stories. So, and, and, and we have a house filled with books. I mean, as it is, my wife's a college professor and it's, it's crazy. Um, but I, I, his vocabulary, now he's 18, he's going off to college. Um, he has the biggest vocabulary, and that came almost exclusively from listening. Uh, he reads now, uh, but again, he, he probably more often listens uh, uh, than reads. Um, 
so I, I co-authored a book uh, with Tom Yorton called Yes And, which yes. is all about improvisation uh, and business. Um, and uh, one of the things that we talk about um, is the work of Peter Drucker. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and for those who don't know, Drucker, uh, management theorist, Viennese, I believe, mm-hmm. um, and talks a lot about um, the, the need to get rid of hierarchies. They don't work. Uh, and talks about flat organizational structures. And we have a concept of Second City called Follow the Follower, uh, which essentially is a way that when you're creating as a group, you trade off leadership uh, at any given time. Um, and it was fun to find out that like you're a big Drucker fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk to me about him. So, you know, I, the, I think the first Drucker book that I read was The Effective Executive, um, mm-hmm. which is a pretty, I mean, I think is one of his seminal um, pieces of work um, that, that teaches sort of, you know, so the principles of management and general practice. What I like about Drucker's work in general is just as you said that I mean it, it really is it, at its core to me is about how we as people interact and uh, learning how we can do that in a more effective way. So whether it is um, as a member of a team, as um, as a defined role as a leader, um, is it uh, and how we just communicate um, as a group. And it is um, you know within a business setting, it's all about how we can um, most effectively and, um, and efficiently um, produce or perform our mission. So for me, in a you know in a mission-driven environment, um, you know, our bottom line is in, you know, par- our profit margin, our bri- bottom line is, is is measured in lives that we change. And so it's, I think that, it, you know, if you're doing it well in a nonprofit setting like ours, it's actually more complicated. Um, and, and, and so taking um, uh, management practices and leadership practices that are proven the, um, to be effective to me is, is 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 essential to ensuring that we're performing our mission to the best of our ability and helps us maximize the lives that we change on the ground. So that's why, you know, when I first got to know about Peter Drucker, I um, devoured his books early on in my very first mm-hmm. sort of management job and have continued to um, stay connected. Um, and, and there's a lot of folks who sort of write in the same style and the same principles um, that I also follow. Well, yeah. And and, and he, he wrote a long while ago. And I mean, and this stuff is, you know, still, I, I think, fairly cutting oh, edge. Oh, still considered that, you know, he is the yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, great quote I found from him, which was, the only thing we know about the future is that it will be different. <laughs> That's a good one. I haven't it's, heard that oh, one was, And, and what I, again, what I love about that, and it's the same thing of understanding that there's a dynamic exists in the present uh, time in terms of your leadership, but that, that it is going to change. Mm-hmm. So you need to constantly be adapting and changing, which then goes back to how we think about libraries and how libraries are presented to us, because uh, it, w- it was a revelation to me uh, uh, in terms of like, like your, your website's great. Like, and I'm like, how does the Chicago Public Library have such a great website? Thank you. I um, we we redesigned the website actually a, a couple of uh, years ago, really with readers in mind. Um, uh, what we found, um, uh, what you probably know if you if you looked at our website, is that we have uh, it's it's a card based system, and that while we have about a million people visit our website a month. Um, most people are going there to find something, um, something to read, something to listen to, um, something to... So they're always going to search. So what we did is we really fo- focused on how we can improve search, how we can improve discovery and serendipity around what people are looking for. But we also thought was really fun about the opportunity, since most people are coming to our webpage, like Google, just to find something, the rest of that home, that homepage is actually can be um, a point of discovery and, um, and exploration. So we sort of moved, made, made it much more dynamic. The, literally, the website changes every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, we're um, engaging with our users in a much more um, uh, interactive way than we did before, um, but that's just one other way that we've, you know, that you know that we're looking at how we can uh, be a better touch point, a better data point for our, our customers. Uh, what's your relationship to tech? Are you a, are you a tech guy? Um, so, you know, I, I did my graduate work in information um, uh, and library sciences with, mm-hmm. a, with a focus on um, data, data management, information uh, science management. So I definitely have that background. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time since I was really in that. You know, and obviously the technology changes. Uh, um, Substantially, I was a CIO um, when I was in San uh-huh. Francisco. I was a CIO for the San Francisco Public Library. Um, but my interest in tech has always really been the same: is that it, it really is about what we're trying to achieve, and is there a technology or a tool that can facilitate that in a way that's helpful? And so, to me, technology is, is really isn't about technology for technology's sake. Um, sometimes the best technologies are the most you know the simple ones. So you know, a book is a technology, right? Um, right. A print book. And so, um, uh, so it's really through that lens that we that I look at technology as more of a of a mechanism mechanism to improve an experience as a mechanism to um, to help uh, uh, help someone achieve their goals in a new way. Again, technology for me has been you know really important um, using assistive technology in, in, in the way that I've pro- been able to learn um, and, and to read and to you know you know it was much more difficult when I was in school and you didn't have access to all the digital technologies that you could actually listen to through assistive technology. So that's how I think about it. It's more um, 
it's, it's more understanding the technology so that you can leverage it to improve experience. Right, right, got it. Um, you guys gave away a million books. Yes. Uh, why and how did that work out? Uh, so uh, this again, like our, you, you know, our, our children's librarians are, you know, one of the things I love about librarians, but particularly children's librarians, is they're so in tune to the kids that, that they're serving. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I first started at Chicago Public Library, we sent the, you know, the, a team out and said, hey, come back with some really innovative ideas about how we can improve the lives of our children in Chicago. Um, uh, uh, the first thing they came back with was, you know, many of the kids we see in libraries are hungry. Like, so that was their, their innovative idea wow. was like, we got to figure out a way to make sure Feed that the kids. kids have healthy snacks. Like some really practical, they had a lot of really sort of crazy ideas too. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really w- was the genesis of the Million Book Giveaway that we're doing this summer. Last summer, we gave away 30,000 books away. Um, this summer, again, we were looking at the, you know, the, 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 the team was looking at the summer and they came back and said, hey, look, you know, we know that children, not just in Chicago, but across the country, they're living at or below poverty level, uh, which unfortunately is a lot of children. Um, mm. uh, there is one book in the home, age appropriate book, one book, age appropriate book in the home for every 300 kids. Ugh. Just think about that. So you just talked about the big library you have at home. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and access to, 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 to age appropriate materials is directly linked to a child's success in school, particularly zero to five. And so, and, and then when you look at children who are middle income and above, it is 13 books for every child, you know, the 13 books for every one child. So mm-hmm. there's a big difference. And so their very simple and radical idea was like, you know, what if we set out a goal to get to help every kid in the city, whether they have books in the home or not, to have their own library. And so every kid who signs up for our summer learning challenge, so that's roughly 100,000 kids, at the day they sign up, uh, rather than giving them as raffle prizes or book giveaways, they get 12 books that are age appropriate that they get to select themselves. And um, you know, we're now a few weeks into the program, and we've given away you know thousands and thousands of books. But it's been really interesting for the team to see that we are actually seeing new families that we didn't see before. Mm-hmm. Folks who are really excited, and these kids are excited to get their, in some cases, their first book. In some cases, this is adding to their home collection. But again, the whole the whole premise is really, um, if we're going to encourage kids to read during the summer. Let's make sure they have books, not just books that are from the library, but books that they actually own and they can read over and over themselves, that they can read with their parents. And so it's both a really fun thing um, for us to do, but it's also a really necessary thing to do. And I think if, uh, as we as we enter into next summer, we'll likely, you know, hopefully if our funders support it, um, continue to, to, you know, to support this endeavor of helping every child in the city, regardless of their, their income levels or their, you know, their, you know, their family's ability um, to make sure that they have a library that is appropriate for them and it's books that they want to read and they get to keep. Yeah, and I have to imagine that there are uh, other kinds of benefits that go along with that, right? Psychological and otherwise, community building and otherwise. Yeah, I mean, there's actually, there's, there's a, I didn't realize this. Again, the team reflects it back. There's just a huge amount of research just specifically on books in the home and, and how it's linked to educational outcomes, how it's linked sure. to creativity, those kinds of things. So it's, you know, again, libraries giving away free books seems pretty pretty uh, pretty straightforward, uh, but there's a real need for it, and it's based in something that our team has seen and, um, and that the research supports. All right, so I, I tool around Chicago neighborhoods. When did this like mini giveaway library thing start happening? You know what I'm talking about? The oh yeah, um, they're the, called. Uh, they're like they look like little birdhouses. They do look like birdhouses, yeah. and they've got books. And yeah. I, I guess the citizens of the block probably put some books in there. You know, those popped up. Uh, I feel like I saw those in Seattle, so they've probably been around about a decade. Um, uh-huh. they, they come in and out of style, but really, it's it's just it's you know, take a book, give a book. It's a very simple, very localized, not something that is typically done through a formal municipal public library. It's typically done like literally a just neighborhood, like. A book swap kind of thing. Um, I love it. I think it's such a cool it's thing. Like library that, outreach. Like out, yeah. And, and actually, we, it's funny you mentioned. Ago, I was just talking to the mayor. He was um, mm-hmm. asking if maybe I should, we should consider um, doing those. We're actually talking about does it make sense for you know the Chicago Library to do something like that? But I love that. And I think you know um, there's also a, similar kinds of programs where people will leave a book on a train or they'll leave different books around the mm-hmm. city. And the idea is you read it and you write a notation and you leave it. But I love all those sort of. Um, Fun ways uh, and creative ways that people um, uh, with strangers sort of share share what they're reading, yeah. share what they're learning, um, and really, you know, we do the same thing sort of through a traditional public library. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of fun to see. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the free marketplace of ideas is something that we think about a lot. Um, you know, at Second City, the structure of the evening is a two act scripted review and a third act that's all improvised. That is free, uh, and and that has been for nearly sixty years. Um, and I think it is a vital uh, part of our creative ecosystem on, on many levels, not just to attract audience, uh, but uh, that philosophy of let, there should be things out there that anyone can go to, mm-hmm. that there's no barrier, because uh, because there's not much. Yeah. 
There's not a lot of free. Yeah, and I th- I think that actually as it relates to public libraries, I also you know I th- I, th- I totally agree with you. Um, but I also think that we're in this funny moment in time where uh, whether we've intended to do it or not, we're, we're increasingly siloing our society. Yeah. Um, that um, you know people are more likely to be around people that look like them, that think like them, um, are of the same income bracket as them, and the impact on society long term. There's actually a lot of people who are writing about this: sociologists, mm-hmm. psychologists, and economists, and um, it, you know, the impact on creativity, the impact on innovation. I mean, just at the core of what innovation is, it's bringing together disparate ideas, and it's in that sort of that those those things connecting that real new new insights emerge. And so, um, as we look now at public libraries, I think it's really interesting that uh, we recently did um, a full market research analysis of people who are checking just checking out materials from Chicago Public Library, and what was reflected back um, was really it was surprising, but also heartening, is that um, it was an, a pretty even cross section of the entire. Um, city, so hmm. the wealthiest, the poorest, and everything in between, and what you know, what it reflected back for us, which we we sensed, but it's sort of reconfirmed, is that we're really one of the few institutions left that are really serving the entire cross section of our society and of our communities, and 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 what people who use libraries have in common is their shared interest, their shared curiosity around a question or around an idea, and creating a physical space where those ideas can then collide is, I think, really where our sweet spot is today, and where we really want to grow in the future. And, and, you know, schools are, are having a hard time doing that. I mean, it's like, you know, we've got, you know, specialized schools, private schools, yeah. selective enrollment. And so I think that we need more spaces like libraries that, that really, truly bring together a, a much broader range of people with a, with a much broader range of experience. Um, uh, but it's not just because it's, it's great to have. I think it's essential to the competitive future of our society, but also of our democracy. Well, yeah, and you know, the, we're taping this uh, during a pretty dark time uh, in our, our our nation, our city too, mm-hmm. um, and so much of that comes down to our absolute refusal to look at another person's perspective, um, and because we're not we're not together uh, as as small as the world has gotten, right? For us, that we're able to get all this information and and and, and speak to people, uh, across, you know, miles and miles away, um, uh, we're just as divided too because we're we're not in in the same place with them and that uh, George Saunders wrote a great piece in the New Yorker. I don't know if you saw it. He visited all the Trump rallies, uh, and he interviewed. Oh, um, I haven't read it. No. Yeah, and he interviewed people, really trying to uh, break away from his bias uh, and get to these people. And he, he got close. He'd have conversations, but then they would, you know, go back into the throng. And it's so easy when you're behind a keyboard or you're in a throng or you're perched up somewhere mm-hmm. um, to to miss any connection. So I, I, I yes, a hundred percent, because there are very few places. Uh, uh, where um, uh, that cross section of humanity exists in one place it doesn't happen in the theater. It's uh, you know it's certainly not here. Uh, when we've performed in Atlanta, that's actually mm-hmm. a, a city where uh, the theatrical community is very rich mm-hmm. and diverse, uh, and, it, and it was very uh, um, it was kind of magical uh, to experience. Oh, you know, I just went to the uh, U.S. Women's uh, National Soccer uh, game, um, and uh, they played South Africa at Soldier Field. Incredibly diverse. Hmm. Yeah, and 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 that sort of surprised me. Right. Uh, men, women, gay, straight, black, white, Hispanic. I mean, it was uh, uh, older, younger, mm-hmm. um, and it, it was. I took my daughter. I took my fourteen-year-old daughter. I'm like, this is great that you yeah. get to experience this, and and, and so positive as well. Um, ah, we're getting. We're at the end. We're at the end. Um, one of the things we always ask of our guests on the podcast is if they have a yes and story. So yes and the cornerstone of improvisation. The idea that when you're making something out of nothing. You can't say no. You just can't say yes. You have to say yes and. Um, do you have a story for us? Yeah. Um, actually, I would say my I have lots of them, but I think one of my sort of best yes and stories was my decision to leave Seattle um, to go take a job in San Francisco uh, to lead um, uh, the neighborhood libraries. Uh, I had sort of I'm a planner, and I decided I was you know I was getting ready to buy a sailboat. I had this tiny little 400 square foot cottage in the city, sort of in Seattle, planned my future. And um, I got this uh, call, this opportunity to to leave all of that and go take on a highly political job running the city's largest capital program in the in the in the city's history for libraries. Um, and not knowing the city, not 
not ha- ever having done that level of job before, I really, um, uh, I, I really decided, you know what, I guess, I guess mine as well. And, um, you know, in hindsight, um, I could have very easily said no to that. Um, I could have very easily stayed and gotten my little sailboat and, mm-hmm. you know, essentially slipped into retirement in the San Juan Islands in this little, you know, community that I grew up in. Um, but that decision, uh, while it was the hardest job probably that I've ever had to do, well, then the one I do now is pretty hard too. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, um, it was the kind of uh, pain that was really a good pain and it was kind of learning that was a really good learning and um, I think sort of taught me that you know as a person I can take on challenges bigger than myself and um, and I've continued to sort of uh, learn that lesson over and over so that was probably the first self-inflicted change um, that Mm -hmm. I said yes to um, and I continue to say yes today that's great thank you thank you you can find out more information about Brian and all the fantastic programs uh, at the Chicago Public Library uh, at shypublib.org see you next week on getting the yes and